I'd like to thank you for listening to my presentation today. I had most of my career, um, spent most of my career at the University of Illinois in Chicago, uh, the medical center there, the College of Medicine. I was the director of the division of speech pathology there. And I started seeing patients with spasmodic dysphonia in the 1980s. Several patients that I was seeing, um, they just they said to me they would like to talk with other people who had spasmodic dysphonia. So in 1990, we started the Spasmodic Dysphonia Support Group of Chicago, and I served as the sponsor coordinator of that group for about 10 years. After relocating to Florida, I attended the Fort Myers Naples SD Support Group for many years. I currently have a private practice in Port Charlotte, Florida, specializing in the evaluation and treatment of people with voice disorders. I'm an adjunct faculty member in the Department of Communication Disorders and Sciences, Sciences and Disorders, I'm sorry, at the University of South Florida in Tampa, and the 2020 recipient of the Clinical Career Award from the Florida Association of Speech Language Pathologists and Audiologists. I was fortunate enough in Chicago to participate at their voice center uh, team. And the two key members of that team typically are of any voice team uh, would be the otolaryngologist, the ENT physician. And if they did a um, fellowship in laryngology, that would be a laryngologist, focusing on everything involving the larynx and voice. The other key member would be someone like myself, a speech language pathologist. And if we have a lot of experience and expertise in voice, we're often referred to as a voice therapist. And as you can imagine, in a big medical center like at the University of Chicago, or University of Illinois, rather, in Chicago, we could pull in other professionals. We could certainly consult by phone or actually have them come when we were seeing patients. That would include a neurologist, gastroenterologist, audiologist, singing teacher, voice coach, psychologist, physical therapist, among others. I've been practicing long enough to have seen patients before Botox was widely used as well as after. And I think because Botox was so effective as a treatment, our role on the voice team started to be more minimal. The patient would often enter the medical system by seeing an either, either the otolaryngologist, laryngologist, or a neurologist be cross-referred to the other professional and then we might see them for an evaluation only to confirm the diagnosis or perhaps not at all before they were referred for Botox. And because of that, I think that is changing maybe more recently now, but because of that, patients started to seek alternative therapies, such as with vocal coaches, chiropractors, massage therapists, acupuncturists, et cetera. Now, if there is a treatment involved other than Botox, I think you always have to ask what the efficacy is of the treatment. And this gets us into that category of science versus the slippery slope of pseudoscience, science being fact-based. And pseudoscience, I think you can sum up with the phrase that we, all, we are all familiar with. If it sounds too good to be true, and you can fill in the blank there. Um, so I think it's always wise when you're seeking information about spasmodic dysphonia to stay with the NSDA. Um, when you start to go off on the World Wide Web or some other media, social media sites, I think then information may be less fact-based. So you want to stay with sites that have fact-based information about spasmodic dysphonia. What can we as speech language pathologists offer to individuals with SD? And I think we can be certainly part of your comprehensive voice care. We can complete voice evaluations and deliver voice therapy. We can also support you. And this has been uh, noted before in presentations in front of the NSDA, but the different identities people with spasmodic dysphonia may assume. In our culture, we certainly have a lot of battle language when it comes to dealing with chronic medical conditions, like I'm fighting my cancer or I lost my battle with cancer. 
So that feeling of fighting spasmodic dysphonia or fighting the spasms may be one of the identities you've had over the years. And I've also known patients who were totally defined by spasmodic dysphonia. That was the reason they didn't have the relationship they wanted, the job they wanted, um, maybe had not lived the life they really wanted. So that may not be that helpful. But the identity of living with it, having it be part of you, but not your soul identity, may be the most helpful. And again, you may, as I alluded to, switch these identities along your voice course, but we can support you in that. Um, also, we can be an advocate for you, an advocate for you with other voice team members, possibly with other family members or friends, or uh, with your colleagues at work. So I'd like to revisit voice therapy and put it in context, in the context of your overall uh, treatment plan. For all patients that we see with voice disorders, we have three categories of considerations. Certainly, speaker considerations are paramount, how the voice sounds to you and how it feels to produce, how much effort you expend in producing your voice. Also, how your listeners are responding, and we are one of your key listeners, we're trained listeners, and traditionally, this area has been in our area of expertise. And of course, the underlying laryngeal structure and function traditionally in the physician's area of expertise. For individuals with spasmodic dysphonia, how the voice actually feels to produce, the effort you use to produce it, may be paramount um, in driving you to seek certain treatments, even perhaps more important than how your voice sounds. So we certainly take that into consideration when we're seeing patients. What can a voice evaluation provide to you as someone with spasmodic dysphonia? As part of the evaluation, we assess your current needs and help you set goals for voice therapy or your overall voice treatment. We subjectively, um, by just listening to your voice and noting our impressions, and objectively actually measure your vocal parameters with instrumentation, we measure your voice that way and we can document current speech and vocal behaviors. And I'm separating the two out, but that'll become clearer as this talk goes on. My patients roll their eyes when they see me coming at them with a pile of surveys to fill out, but that's very important information for us. Based on the survey responses, we can determine your current feelings about your voice and speech and the impact that has on your quality of life, as well as determine the need for additional referrals, such as to audiology, psychology, counseling, et cetera. And what can traditional voice therapy provide to you, someone with SD? We educate you about voice production and treatment approaches. We assess and then as part of treatment, modify certain speech and vocal behaviors, which may not be helpful and we want to reduce them. And in so doing, that might actually extend the time between Botox shots if you're receiving Botox. And of course, we can support you. We are your vocal coach and your cheerleader. In terms of patient education, I like to talk to my patients about larynx location, its role in airway protection, swallowing, and the impacts of acid reflux and hydration on the voice. We talk a lot about the larynx as a sound generator, and this diagram doesn't show the extrinsic laryngeal muscles, the muscles that hold the larynx in place and they're outside the larynx, but it does show some of the intrinsic laryngeal muscles. The takeaway being that the larynx is a very, very muscular structure. You may have seen these images of your own vocal folds as you're producing voice during an examination. The left hand image would be vocal folds when you're speaking, when they're approximated. And the right hand image would be when they're open, when you're breathing. I really like this diagram and I'm gonna spend a little time here talking about voice production as a mechanical system with three subsystems that are working together. 
And I think talking about voice, we don't think of voice as a mechanical system, but I think talking about that takes a little bit of the emotional component out of it. And obviously voice is an emotional thing. It's part of our identities. It's we're talking to people and we might have emotional conversations. So it's a little hard to do, but in tapping that down a little bit, I think that's helpful in deciding what might be beneficial in terms of treatment. And we all probably are aware of these subsystems, the first one being respiration, the second being phonation or vocal fold vibration, the vibrating vocal folds in your larynx, and then head resonance. We know to produce voice, you first inhale, you start to exhale, the vocal folds approximate, and that airstream drives them into vibration. That creates a pressure variation in the air, sound energy wave, that goes into your head and your head acts as a resonator. The head gives you some nice qualities to your voice, that interaction. Um, so these subsystems are very interactive and we're learning more and more about that all the time. They can have, each one can have, a, have negative impacts on the other ones or positive impacts. As an example, in vocal fold paralysis, this is where you're, you may have one or, or more, the two vocal folds that don't approximate well. So every time the vocal folds uh, are attempting to vibrate, more air is released on each of those attempts. So you may feel winded when you're talking, like you're breathless and you have a breathing problem. You don't actually have a breathing problem. Respiration is okay, but the valving mechanism, the vocal fold vibration is what's a problem, but it makes you feel like you have problems in this than the respiration subsystem. Another way to look at this is for spasmodic dysphonia. When you're having a spasm at the vocal fold level, you may feel there's a breakdown in the fluency of your speech. Um, so the resonance and articulatory system at the head resonance and articulation there, it may be having a breakdown, so you feel there's actually a problem there when it's not that, but again, it's the valving. Alternatively, alternatively, we can use the respiration subsystem and the resonance subsystem to have a positive impact on vocal fold vibration. So we can use those subsystems uh, in that way, so that can be very helpful. For normal voice production, these three systems are in balance. And again, that doesn't mean they're doing equal work, but they are working in harmony. Now for everybody who comes through our doors with a voice disorder, almost all of the problems that we see, it's a matter of the laryngeal mechanism, including the vocal folds and involving the muscles inside and outside the larynx, working too hard to produce voice. And I'm speaking now about voice disorders in general, not specifically spasmodic dysphonia, but if you have this vocal effort over a period of time, you can develop vocal symptoms like hoarseness, breathiness, vocal fatigue, an inability to project the voice, a weak sounding voice, and periodic or continuous voice loss. You might even develop a vocal pathology, such as vocal fold nodules, a vocal polyp, and in extreme cases, and usually acute cases of very loud voice use, you might develop a vocal fold hemorrhage. Sometimes you can even have neck pain, stiffness and soreness, throat pain or soreness, shoulder and ear pain. Um, you can have shortness of breath, and you might develop increased throat clearing because you have too much vocal effort. If you lessen the effort and restore more normal muscle forces, the laryngeal and vocal fold status will typically improve and a more normal sounding and performing voice will be restored. Associated throat, neck, ear, and shoulder symptoms may resolve and throat clearing may decline or resolve. So again, for voice disorders in general, this may be the case. So, like everything in life, it seems, less 
is more. In this case, less muscle involvement or effort at the larynx level may equal a better voice. This formula or equation, I like to say it's an equation, uh, I really like for spasmodic dysphonia. And many of you have listened to other voices of individuals with spasmodic dysphonia. You hear a wide range, everything from essentially a normal sounding voice with almost no, no evidence of tremor or I'm sorry, spasms at all, uh, very normal sounding or close to normal, to a voice that is very affected by the spasms to the point where the person is almost um, not understandable. So what causes that wide range of voices? The voice that you hear with spasmodic dysphonia is a combination of the underlying disruptive laryngeal movements themselves, the spasms, and what the mechanism does in response to that. That can be unconscious or actually what the listener may be doing, a conscious compensation in response to the spasms. So if you combine the two, for example, right after your Botox shot, your spasms may be less frequent and of a less magnitude. Therefore, the compensations may be less too, and the sum of those together would be a voice that sounds improved and less notable. Again, if it's right before a Botox shot or if you have severe SD, you might have a lot of spasms of a notable magnitude lot of compensations in response, so now your voice is very affected. You might ask, can I eliminate or lessen the underlying disruptive laryngeal movements? And in general, we don't think that that can happen, but there are treatments that can do that. Certainly Botox being the most widely used, surgeries have been described to affect the spasms, to lessen them. Uh, we have brain and nerve stimulation, which not only provides information about SD, but can also be offered as a treatment. And certain medications um, can affect the spasms as well. You might also ask then, can I eliminate or lessen the disruptive compensatory behaviors or responses to those spasms? And yes, you can. Voice therapy is one way to do that. So what does it entail? After we complete a comprehensive voice evaluation, the voice therapy is the program of voice care and also then voice exercises. In more detail, the program of voice care we would do with everyone, that's an, a part of all voice therapies. Again, we will identify unhelpful speech and vocal behaviors and in therapy, attempt to reduce or eliminate them. And then we can improve the remaining voice with voice exercises as we might do with all in all voice therapies. And these will address the muscle tension dysphonia and or vocal tremor you might have that can co-occur with spasmodic dysphonia. We also address any uncomfortable speaking situations you may have um, that may cause speaking fears and anxieties as part of the therapy as well. Here I've highlighted aspects of voice therapy, uh, certain goals that may pertain more to people with spasmodic dysphonia. These are general goals we use for all voice therapies, but in the case of SD, improving the sound of the voice, we may focus on that as well as reducing and eliminating vocal effort or fatigue. And then we add to that any specific goals you might have. So I'll go over some of these in detail. The voice care program, we identify and eliminate sources of phonotrauma. We used to call this vocal abuse. We now call it phonotrauma. This can result in vocal fold tissue damage. So we definitely want to identify and eliminate those sources, maintain and improve vocal hydration, and emphasize compliance with anti-acid reflux regimen if that is an issue for you. In my generation and older, cigarette smoking might have been an issue. That thankfully is much less now. However, people are vaping 
and smoking marijuana. So smoking of any type, we would like to eliminate um, and, avoid, and avoiding smoky environments too. Avoiding dust, um, allergens and environmental toxins here in Florida, we have um, toxic algae blooms. We have blue green algae in freshwater. We have red tide in saltwater and red tide is a respiratory um, irritant. So definitely we wanna be aware of our environment and some of the toxins that can lead to uh, voice uh, larynx irritation. Limit alcohol consumption and coffee and soda pop. Coffee happens to be a beverage that for certain individuals can really cause a lot of voice problems. I had a colleague I worked with at the university, one or two sips of coffee, his voice became hoarse. Um, I've worked with a few patients in my career like that, that coffee was really the culprit. So any items, diet items, foods or beverages that bother you, take note of those and eliminate those from your diet. Eliminating throat clearing. I mentioned that throat clearing can um, be kicked up by vocal, uh, vocal effort, vocal fatigue, and also for, by acid reflux. So we look to eliminate that. That can um, be irritating for the vocal folds. Certainly we wanna eliminate abusive shouting, yelling, screaming, or loud voice use, and avoiding again, noisy environments where we have to project our voice loud over noise for long periods of time, uh, avoiding excessive speaking if you're experiencing vocal fatigue and throat symptoms. Um, you can use an amplifier certainly if you have to be in those environments of noise, but we want to watch all of that. For voice care for vocal hygiene, we definitely look to maintain an adequate amount of water consumption and water is the preferred beverage for sure. Um, people are drinking other things, but water really is helpful. The vocal folds are um, covered by a slimy mucosal cover and that is what vibrates when they come together. So you do want to have that mucosal cover adequately hydrated. This is systemic hydration. And I have to say, I have to admit that we do not know the right amount of water consumption in ounces uh, of water per day for every individual. Um, I would say anecdotally in my 40 years of treating voice disorders that probably about 48 ounces of water uh, per day is a kind of a minimum that people should be consuming. And you're going to be taking other beverages in addition to that and getting some liquid through the food that you eat. So having that water um, in you is good. Not drinking it all at once, that can cause a little spike in your blood pressure. If you have bladder, kidney, or heart uh, conditions, you might need to check with your physician and they can recommend uh, the water maximum that you can consume. Some people are also very sensitive to surface hydration. Um, and that would mean adding more humidification into your environment. Anything that's good for your body is good for your voice. So getting adequate sleep, eating balanced meals and exercising your entire body. In addition to voice exercises, that's always a good thing. We used to think in the 1980s and 1990s, we kind of explained almost all voice disorders in terms of acid reflux. Now we know that that's much more nuanced. It can be a contributing factor in some patients and maybe not in others, but if it is an issue for you, taking your medication as prescribed, um, not doing behavioral changes like not eating or drinking possibly before lying down, avoiding those food items I mentioned that can cause digestive problems, avoiding reducing possibly co coffee, alcohol, and soda pop, and elevating the head of the bed. Now I did allude to um, unhelpful speech versus vocal behavior, so let's talk more about them. And we look again in therapy to reducing or eliminating them. We are a fast talking society. We rarely run across people who are talking too slowly, but we certainly have heard people talking too quickly. And thinking back about that mechanical system I mentioned, 
with those three subsystems for voice production. We all have mechanical systems in our lives, such as possibly cars and um, we have appliances and they operate in a most effectively or efficiently in a certain range. They have a range of operation. Well, our voice production, speech production mechanism has also a range of operation. So if I'm talking too quickly, my system may start to function less optimally. I might start slurring my words. Um, I might not be able to take enough of a breath to support my voice and my speech. So now I'm in trouble. Um, so we don't want people talking too fast. And if you do talk too quickly, you may be saying a lot of words on one breath and not be giving that respiration subsystem um, enough or, or using that with your voice production, uh, your vocal full vibration efficiently enough to be able to have a good voice. So we definitely need good breath support. We need to take adequate breaths. We don't wanna to say too many words per breath. Um, all of that can get us into some trouble with voice and speech. And we know speech, people that have had speech that's not clear. Um, we want clear, intentional speech. Speech sounds produced correctly. Um, we want to have that for all of our patients. So that's something too to keep in mind. Switching now to voice, some people use voices that are too loud. And they may, again, with SD, want to power through that um, spasm, or they may take a different approach and talk very softly, thinking that if they talk softly, they're using less effort and they're easier on their larynx. And that's not quite true. So either one of those approaches can be detrimental. Some people have a monotone voice where they don't use a lot of expression and the voice is very one note-ish. Um, so, and some people do use that excessive vocal effort again to power through the spasms and all of that can be unhelpful. So we can then reuse the uh, vo voice exercises to improve the remaining voice like we would do in all voice therapies. Now in traditional voice exercises, we achieve all or most of the goals by having the patient consistently complete voice exercises that achieve efficient vocal fold closure and reduce the amount of muscle effort or tension used in speaking. This way of vocalizing is then carried over into conversational speech and a maintenance program is developed and the patient is discharged from therapy. We model the voice exercises, the patient then does them after us. We give patients typed instructions for their daily home practice and then they transition the new voice into conversational speech. The ultimate, ultimate success is that every time the person opens their mouth, they're essentially practicing that good voice and reinforcing it. Now voice exercises, traditional exercises might help in reducing the vocal effort or are designed to do that, reduce hoarseness and raspiness, address age related voice exercises or voice changes, I'm sorry, that we may all experience as we age, address muscle tension dysphonia, and a specialized program to look at vocal tremor by Julie Barkmeyer Kramer is very effective um, in addressing that. So we may use those uh, as part of the voice therapy. All of you may realize that you have voice fluctuations. The good day, bad day um, thing is very characteristic of SD. And there are certain times when your voice is better um, and certain times when it's more difficult. You probably are all aware of that, but if not, keeping a voice diary or log for several days, maybe longer, to note when your voice is better and effort is less and when that uh, changes and voice is more difficult. It may be due to your voice use, the time of day, certain emotional factors, certain things in your environment, the people you're talking to, the circumstances, or certain foods and beverages that you consume. We use information like this to develop a hierarchy of difficult situations, going from those in which your voice is best with least vocal effort, 
all the way up to when it is most difficult and there is mo most vocal effort involved. And this can also be helpful, helpful in addressing the speaking fears and anxieties that you might have in developing strategies for addressing them. So let me give you three examples. And these involve three patients that I've seen over the years. And that will help maybe tie together all the things that we've been talking about so far. The first patient was someone that I met in the 1980s when I first started in Chicago. And when I was in Chicago, I was seeing head and neck cancer patients as well as voice patients. Um, I decided to join a walking group in Evanston. For those of you who are familiar with the area, Evanston's a nice suburb, beautiful Lake Michigan. You can walk right along it. Wanted to meet people and get some exercise at the same time. So I joined the group and the, one of the first people I met or certainly someone I overheard when I was at that first meeting was a man, I can't remember exactly his age. I think he was in uh, young adult or midlife. And he had a voice that sounded severely strained and raspy. He sounded kind of like this. His voice was pretty continuous, but it was very strained. Of course, having seen head and neck cancer patients, my first thought was he, he might have cancer. He might have either been treated for it, and that could involve, depending on where the cancer is, vocal fold scarring. If that's severe, it can have a notable voice impact, or possibly he hadn't sought treatment yet. In which case, if I didn't say anything, that could be life-threatening. So I did a very brief, should I, shouldn't I, should I, shouldn't I, and I decided to say something, identify myself and, and my background. And so at a break, I was able to get him apart from the other group members. And I said, uh, you know, what happened with your voice or I identified myself. And he said, shockingly, that he did not have laryngeal cancer. He was diagnosed with, I believe we called it back then, spastic um, dysphonia, now spasmodic dysphonia. I was absolutely shocked. I have, again, never heard anybody before or since that sounded like that with spasmodic dysphonia. So I talked with him about coming to see me at the university. He did, I had another colleague involved too. And it turned out that he was actually, for lack of a better word, bearing down on his larynx and causing a lot more vocal effort, but it possibly gave him a feeling of control over his voice, um, kind of lessened the spasms, if you will, and, and just made him feel more comfortable. But certainly um, it was not advantageous for voice production, and he was able to eliminate that. His voice sounded to my colleague and me as very much improved. It was great. We were very happy, but he did not want to continue that. He did not continue therapy. We lost track of him, but he was comfortable with his approach of dealing with his SD, and he resumed it. Um, so again, that is an example of an unhelpful um, compensation, but he did want to continue with that. The next two patients are patients I've seen much more recently here in Florida. The second patient worked part-time in a big box store, and he would see customers coming towards him to ask him a question, obviously, about what's in aisle such and such, or where can I find such and such. Um, and he would feel his speaking anxiety starting to increase. He would take a large inhalation and then he would start speaking maybe a little bit louder. He would talk very quickly and he would, his voice would essentially get tighter and tighter with much more effort as he went through. And he was often hard for them to understand and the store is noisy. Um, at the end of the day, he would said he would come home and he'd be absolutely exhausted to the point of wanting to quit his job because he just felt completely wiped out. I had also seen him 
over a period of time. And he came to me the second time thinking that his spasmodic dysphonia was actually getting worse. When in fact, because I have the recordings of his voice and using certain strategies, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, his voice, his SD wasn't changing. His compensation was changing. He was doing more compensatory behaviors that were counterproductive. And therefore his overall voice and speech were worse. But when he took those away, he sounded the same basically. And he sounded very good. What did he do? It was a combination of things. And he could certainly, when people come up to him, he could disclose something about himself. He could say, I'm having a bad voice day, if that in fact was true, and he wanted to use that uh, strategy. And that does a number of very positive things. It discharges speech anxiety. So you feel less anxious because you've given yourself permission to have a few glitches along the way. It also, and we've shown this in some research, the listener feels uh, they can trust you more. It's kind of like almost an instant bonding experience because you're disclosing something about yourself. You're being honest with them. So that goes up and they can also then have permission. You've given them permission to ask you to repeat something if they didn't understand you. So it does a lot of beneficial things. That's one strategy. Also, obviously he didn't need to take this huge inhalation if you think back about the mechanical system, man, he's driving his vocal folds with a lot more airflow than they can probably handle. So they may get tighter in response. So if he took a smaller inhalation to start, then spoke a little bit slower, pausing more often. And every time he paused, his larynx got a little bit of a break. So vocal effort was lower. He said fewer words per breath group. Um, he was able to possibly eliminate some of that strained, strangled behavior of just going, going, going until he had no more uh, breath support left. So all of these things in combination really, really helped him to sound much more fluent, um, minimal spasms or minimal notice of the spasms, um, a much less vocal effort. And he would have to, again, practice that way of speaking. So now it's a way of speaking he's trying to make habitual. Uh, practice that a lot to make that habitual in different speaking situations. Third patient is a woman who honestly had the most mild case of spasmodic dysphonia I have ever heard in my career. Um, she was referred to me by a major um, voice center and two speech pathologists and a laryngologist had evaluated her and confirmed the diagnosis of spasmodic dysphonia. And I concurred in when I first evaluated her. I thought that's, that, that diagnosis was certainly what I would have diagnosed her with, but again, very mild. However, she had two Botox, two or three Botox injections. And as you can imagine, the aftermath of the Botox was much worse for her than her actual voice without it. She still though wanted something to be done and it was a real puzzle uh, as to what to do with her. Um, she, her main issues were actually her speech anxiety and improving her speaking confidence. So that definitely is something we can do. It doesn't have to be Botox as the treatment necessarily for the SD we worked through many different speaking situations that were difficult for her. And one, believe it or not, was the drive-through at McDonald's. Now you can certainly say, forget McDonald's then, you don't have to go there. But that was something that she did and she wanted to continue doing. And as many of you know, you're in the line in your car and you're getting closer and closer and closer to the menu screen. And that may start to invoke some anxiety. So she was worried that when she actually got to the screen and she had experienced difficulty, difficulties before, that she would choke and not be able to get anything understandable out. So a couple of things you can do in those situations, and we talk through what would be the worst case scenario and what can you do in that that case. Obviously, with the way they're configuring the drive-throughs now, it's a little hard to just 
take off like we've seen people possibly do in drive throughs before. Um, but the worst case is that she could get to the window, not say anything. But it would be doubtful that that would happen. So then she could say, again, the disclosure, I'm having some voice problems. Um, let me know if you need me to repeat. And as she was talking, that probably would be less of an issue, given that that anxiety would go down a little bit and she'd be okay. So in all those situations that she had difficulty in, we could work through those and she felt much better. Because her voice was very mild, we also did traditional voice exercises and that gave her a real feeling of voice confidence, that her voice was stable, that it was good, it was robust, and that really helped her overall confidence with her voice. Um, so I, when I got to graduation day and discharged from voice therapy, uh, she was very happy to hear me say, I don't think you will ever need another Botox injection. And also um, she liked to hear that I said, anything that comes up in the future, just give me a call. Once you're my patient, you're always my patient and I am here for you. So again, that vocal coach and cheerleader aspect comes through there. Voice therapy sessions, there are deliver different delivery models for voice therapy that exist. I have the uh, luxury of being able to do a voice evaluation, measurements of the voice and start voice therapy, starting voice therapy all in the same session. It is a long one, but I like doing it that way. And I think patients also like that. Then I might see the patient back um, in three weeks to check on their progress and then over see them for a handful of sessions over many months. Sometimes people have a voice evaluation and then they have the next week or two, they have their first voice therapy session. Some speech pathologists see you once a week for eight weeks. Um, and there are also intensive crash courses of therapy. They may be done over a week or 10 days or over a month. And this could be for a wide, obviously a wide range of voice problems. But I'd like to make uh, a comment about a voice therapy cure or crash course for spasmodic dysphonia in particular. And I think we do know that voice therapy alone will not cure spasmodic dysphonia. That's pretty obvious. Although there are some professionals in my field who do occasionally claim that they their approach can cure spasmodic dysphonia or have done so in the past. That is a buyer beware. Certainly we can improve the voice uh, with voice therapy or you can improve it with voice therapy, but in terms of completely curing it and eliminating it, no. I have to say that professionals even experienced with spasmodic dysphonia and muscle tension dysphonia can disagree about diagnosis. So you could have a patient with muscle tension dysphonia that possibly could be diagnosed with spasmodic dysphonia and quote unquote cured by voice therapy because it's very effective for muscle tension dysphonia, but we have to really watch for that. So again, you have to go into some of this um, thinking that maybe buyer beware on that if, you, uh, if, a, if a voice therapy approach has been labeled as a cure. Additional characteristics of voice therapy for spasmodic dysphonia, it may, as in all voice therapies, only be effective if it can be readily completed. Unique to voice therapy for SD, as I've mentioned before, it could extend the time between your Botox shots and may only be helpful in cases of mild or mild to moderate spasmodic dysphonia. However, if you have a Botox shot, you may be in the mild to mild to moderate category, and that might be a perfect time to initiate voice therapy to work on other issues you might have that can improve your overall voice. So stay tuned. Again, the NSDA is a great resource for up-to-date information on the latest research findings on spasmodic dysphonia. And remember, everyone is unique. Voice therapy, alternative therapies, and lifestyle changes are like a buffet. You can explore ones that may work for you. So what's new on the horizon? In terms of recent advances in voice therapy that may help in spasmodic dysphonia, 
we are learning more about voice production all the time. We have a better and better understanding of it. And that, of course, helps us determine what to do in voice therapy. We are now focusing on a person's readiness for and confidence in their abilities to make changes, the changes required to be successful in voice therapy. And we can measure that and talk that through with you. We have a better understanding of the importance of vocal effort in voice. And we're looking at voice therapy from the viewpoint of exercise physiology. We're trying to answer questions about the benefits of specific voice exercises, how many repetitions of each exercise will be beneficial, how many sessions of exercises should be completed each day. And this might be disorder specific and or patient specific. When I first started in voice, I think we were very aware of a person's feelings about his or her voice, but again, that seemed to recede a little bit into the background and now it's coming to the forefront again. But we are considering that you know, with more importance and also the importance of a patient's involvement in setting individual goals for themselves in voice therapy, their ability to listen and self-correct and the changing cognitive, linguistic, and environmental load on voice production. And what does this mean exactly? Well, for example, when I see my neighbor and I say, hi, how are, we, how are you? Or when you're in therapy and you're counting from one to 10 or from saying the days of the week or the months of the year, that might be a pretty low load and you're doing it in comfort and you're just saying it in your room out loud, but how does your voice change then when you start giving a presentation or speaking in a difficult conversation with someone or speaking about very technical things or speaking in an environment that might be challenging, uh, again, giving a presentation. You could be very successful in a chat with your neighbor or saying, the, the weeks of the, um, the weeks of the, the uh, I'm sorry, the days of the, the week or the months of the year, but these other circumstances are more challenging. They can affect your voice. Kind of along those lines, um, a recent, relatively recent article in the Journal of Voice by a voice professional at Elmhurst University um, she evaluated, she defined and evaluated the frequency of voice breaks in the speech of persons with adductor spasmodic dysphonia as it related to lexical frequency type and density. And she found a higher frequency of voice breaks in the speech involving lexical items of less frequency in the English language and sentences which contained a greater concentration of information units or content words. Now, I don't wanna take an inferential leap here from her research to what I'm about to say, um, but again, giving the example of talking to my neighbor, how are you today may be very frequent in the English language, whereas when I'm giving a talk at a professional meeting, I may be using items that are very uh, much less frequent in the language. And my sentences may contain greater concentration of content words or information units than would be found when I'm saying hi to my neighbor. So all of these things, uh, again, may cause more, a higher frequency of voice breaks, something to think about. A few more things, the importance of speaking confidence um, this may vary in different situations, and you may ask, can it be stabilized? Um, different variables such as the expectations for your own performance. If you have a very high expectation for your performance in any situation, you may have more difficulty with your voice. If you feel, oh, what the heck, whatever happens, happens, I'll be okay, you may have a better voice, less uh, problems with your voice. Certainly adequate preparation. Rehearse, rehearse, rehearse if you're going to be giving a presentation, either talking in church or talking at a professional meeting. Uh, it may be really great to prepare. And as I mentioned a few times here now, disclosure about voice difficulties can really do 
a lot of great things for you as a speaker and for your listeners. So something to consider. And then doing whatever works, obviously, as I mentioned, these techniques are like a buffet and different ones work for different people. So in summary, keep this equation in mind. The voice of SD is a combination of the underlying disruptive laryngeal movements or the spasms themselves, plus the compensations, the responses to those spasms. And while Botox surgery nerve stimulation and certain medications can play a role in altering the underlying spasms of SD, voice therapy, voice therapy may play a role in reducing, eliminating the reflexive and or conscious compensations to those spasms. For the best voice, less is more. Less muscle involvement, vocal effort, at the larynx level, a better voice. Finally, voice therapy for SD draws on principles of voice therapy in general and special considerations for SD. For example, voice exercises, speech strategies may need to be continuously practiced in some form. The voice program needs to fit easily into your daily routine and voice exercises, speech strategies that reduce speaking effort may play an especially critical role in voice therapy for spasmodic dysphonia. The actual content of speech may affect the frequency of spasms. Speaker confidence and feelings about the self and voice are important. Again, disclosure might help. And think of your communication as holding a deck of cards. Voice is just one of the cards in your communication deck. You can work on improving all the cards and putting that voice card back in the deck in the same size that it belongs in. So you have many things with communication that your listeners are responding to. Voice is only one of them. Similarly, taking SD from the hub of your identity to a spoke in terms of your identity would be beneficial. And obviously anything you do that's healthy for your body can have a positive impact on your voice. Remember that we are your speaking and vocal coaches and cheerleaders. Um, we develop exercises and strategies just for you and support you in your vocal journey and doing whatever works to improve your voice, considering the cost and time and money and also the efficacy. I'd like to thank you for your attention to my presentation today.